Today's topic is something in which uh, we have a lot of expertise here at Sinai. Uh, and we're privileged to have uh, Robert Copeland Halpern, who's going to give us a brief overview. Thank you, Dr. Goldman. Uh, so distinguished panelists, Dr. Fuster, uh, Dr. Reddy, uh, visiting Professor Tomaselli, uh, faculty, colleagues, friends, thank you all for being here uh, so we can discuss the topic of inherited arrhythmias today. Inherited arrhythmia syndromes account for 5 to 10 percent of cases of sudden cardiac death, but importantly, they comprise a substantial portion of those occurring in younger, apparently healthy people, people without prior evidence of overt heart disease. Several inherited arrhythmia syndromes have been described but Brugada syndrome, arrhythmogenic ventricular cardio cardiomyopathy, catecholaminergic ventricular tachycardia, and the long QT syndromes are among the most prevalent. These commonly involve mutations in genes coding for cardiac ion channels, but genotypic and phenotypic overlaps between the syndromes have been discovered. And with each new discovery, our understanding increases, as well as the complexity. For example, Brugada syndrome and the third type of long QT appear to share a common genetic mutation, and they may exhibit common electrocardiographic features as well. And beta blocker therapy, while the mainstay of treatment for long QT syndrome, appear most efficacious for those with long QT type 1 and relatively ineffective for patients with long QT type 3. In addition, the less selective beta blocker natalol may have superior efficacy, particularly in patients with long QT type 2. These inherited arrhythmia syndromes are classically associated with apparently structural normal hearts. However, advances in imaging technology have revealed previously unrecognized structural abnormalities that may contribute to the arrhythmia as well. For example, arrhythmogenic ventricular tachycardiomyopathy, which was previously designated ARVD, due to its association with right ventricular dysplasia, is now known to affect both the right and left ventricles, or either ventricle in isolation. Implanted cardioverter defibrillators are a mainstay of management of these patients with life-threatening arrhythmias, but the risk of complications increases with long-term use. And in patients like these who are often young at the time of diagnosis, uh, really judicious management is required and uh, to balance these complications with the benefits of the therapy. Antiarrhythmic medications and lifestyle counseling are also a crucial aspect of management, and they can reduce uh, arrhythmias as well as traumatic defibrillator shocks in these patients. But their efficacy and utility vary with genotype, as I've described, as well as phenotype. Genetic screening plays an important role. However, many patients exhibiting the characteristic phenotype have no causative mutation that's identified when they do the screening. With that in mind, genetic screening and counseling is generally recommended for any patient in whom the cardiologist has a strong clinical suspicion for an inherited condition, either based on the clinical presentation and symptoms or the electrocardiogram. And then screening of family members is generally recommended in any patient in whom a causative mutation is identified. Finally, an important aspect of managing potentially life-threatening arrhythmias in young patients is the approach to the young athlete. Many of these inherited syndromes involve predisposition to arrhythmic events during exercise, and in young patients who feel healthy, the decision to forbid participation in, uh, in sports is potentially devastating. So the approach to young patients like this requires specialized knowledge of both the genetic and molecular mechanisms contributing to these syndromes, but it also requires the humanistic touch that's really at the core of our profession. So in the future, enhances in imaging and screening may improve case detection and personalization of therapy. But the in interaction of these conditions with the more prevalent cardiovascular diseases like atherosclerosis, atrial fibrillation, and the potential impact on the heart-brain interrelationship remain yet undiscovered. So I'm very much looking forward to uh, hearing the insights of our distinguished panelists today on these and many other issues, and I hope you will enjoy our discussion. Thank you. Thank you.
<clears throat> okay, thanks very much, Robert. Uh, this is a challenge to address this uh, complex uh, um, type of rhythm disturbances, and we have the right person here, Dr. Gordon Tomaselli, who um, a good friend and, and certainly a pioneer in many of the aspects that are going to be discussed today. Uh, Dr. Tomaselli was actually born in Portland, in Maine, and apparently at about uh, one month of age, he became very anxious and he came to New York. Is that right? <laughs> right. So he's a driver. I will say that at the present time, as you heard, he's the director of uh, cardiology at uh, Johns Hopkins, the Michael Mirowski professor of cardiology and professor of cellular and molecular medicine, uh, as well as the co-director of the Heart and the Vascular Institute at Johns Hopkins. Well, he actually uh, trained, uh, he had his medical degree at Albert Einstein here in New York, and then he had his intern internship and residency at UCSF. And then he also had the uh, research fellowship following the residency for a period of about a year or two, and then he moved into the cardiology fellowship program at Johns Hopkins. So um, his career has been a stellar, and I will just only give you a few uh, aspects uh, that uh, for you to know who is here today. Um, he has occupied many positions of importance. Uh, he started with the American Heart Association Science Advisory Coordinating Committee. I was the Heart Association in this committee SACC or SAC committee is probably the most important of the Heart Association. Then he was member of the American Heart Association delegation for the United Nations at the high level meeting. American Heart Association International Committee, co chair the subcommittee on prevention of guidelines for the ACC AHA on a number of aspects of guidelines. Then he became president of the Cardiac Electrophysiology Society in the United States and eventually became president of the American Heart Association, I believe was in 2011. So um, he has uh, participated very vigorously in a number of, uh, of um, committees of the Heart Association of the American College of NIH, uh, and he's in the editorial board on a number of journals, uh, certainly in the uh, Heart Rhythm, uh, deputy editor of Circulation Research, he has been, uh, and the journal editor, editorial board of the Journal of Cardiovascular Electrophysiology, associate editor of JAC and Basic to Translational Science, and senior guest editor of Circulation. So, um, among one of the most interesting aspects um, of his career has been the training of a very large number of people. He has sponsored PhD, um, you know, awardees, uh, about 50 uh, people in his career, which I think speaks a lot about the commitment that he has had to the development of research, certainly of the young investigators. Now about extramural funding, uh, over the years, he has obtained 20 NIH grants. That's not simple. And, and I think also it speaks by himself for how much he has been a contributor in research. And you say, but what he has contributed on? Well, he has actually uh, about 300 papers and it's quite fascinating. He started really as a basic investigator and working on the electrical mechanical coupling on both aspects, the electrical aspect and the myocardial mechanical aspect. Then he moved experimentally and certainly more recently clinically. And he has been always an advocate for understanding the basic mechanisms of rhythm disturbances and certainly how the electrical mechanical coupling uh, is affected and many of the rhythm disturbances that we are going to be talking today actually relate to, to such process. 
So um, I just like to say to you that um, he is a fantastic example for the um, for the academic community. His head of cardiology certainly at Hopkins. He continues to work on basic science. He's very involved in the development of young people and in the development of, of investigators. And now I can see he's having some trends into the issues of prevention. And this is why he has been so involved now in the most recent guidelines actually had by Dr. Halperin, uh, guidelines of the AHA and ACC being part of a number of, uh, of preventive strategies. Well, thank you very much for coming with us, Gordon, today. And I'm going to give you a plug for you to remember your visit here. Here is a check. I'm sorry, it's not too heavy. <laughs> and for, uh, express, we all express appreciation to you, Gordon, for outstanding teaching, wisdom, and expertise as the Anandi Sharma Visiting Professor in the Simon Dag Memorial Lecture, January 23rd. Thank you so later. much. It's an honor to be here. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a pleasure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. So, uh, we have so many experts today. Uh, certainly, uh, Robert, you should be there, Dr. William Wong, Marinoel Langan, Amy Kontrovich, Valentin Fuster, give me a rest today. Uh, <laughs> and Vivek Red is going to be the moderator, all right? You sit here in the middle. Good. Okay. okay. Thank you. So um, we have a lot of topics to get through. Dr. Fisher, you're not going to join us? No, just watch you. Okay. <laughs> well, you're still in the audience, so we can still get you. Um, so just before getting started, there's two things I just wanted to say. Um, first, I don't remember, if, I don't know if Gordon remembers, but when I was a cardiology fellow, I actually interviewed at Hopkins as one of the places for my electrophysiology fellowship. And I remember being struck by a number of things um, at Hopkins in general, but also uh, Gordon. He's one of the very few electrophysiologists that I'm aware of who's maintained a very active clinical presence, both in terms of seeing patients, taking care of patients, and staying abreast of the literature, and at the same time running a tremendous um, basic science program, as Dr. Fust already mentioned. And um, that's what I, I was hoping to be a Gordon Tomaselli. I didn't quite make it. Uh, my career went a different direction. But, um, but I just wanted to say it's an honor for me to, for me to be here. Second, uh, I really want to, I, I don't think I responded to Robert. Um, he sent an email, as he dutifully, as all the fellows dutifully do on a, over the weekend with the, with the uh, monograph. And I have to say, this is one of the best monographs I've seen with so many different areas to cover. Robert did a great job. Uh, I probably didn't reply to email, so sorry about that. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, we're not going to touch every aspect of all of these uh, syndromes. That would take probably five or six hours. But I do want to try to touch a, a few things that I was interested in. And I'll try to keep this obviously current. I'm going to focus on the 2015 uh, guidelines. Um, I'm also going to use slides today, unlike the usual controversies, just because there's so much information. It's hard for me to, to do this without. I think it'll be hard for the audience to follow. We don't have an ACC AHA guidelines um, that, are that are very recent. I mean, the last was, I believe, in 2013, 2012 or 2013. So I thought the 2015 ESC guidelines were, were useful. So we're going to start there. And I want to start off with, um, with this slide uh, to just talk about risk stratification and long QT syndrome. You know, as Robert pointed out, there are a number of different uh, long QT uh, syndromes. Um, there's, there's three main ones that we think about, long QT 1, 2, and 3. One is the most common, um, and 3 is the least common. And I think that, um, and I want to get into some of the, the genetics of this. But first, let's talk at a high level. Now, what I wanted to do is just to go through some of these recommendations and then ask our panel to comment on some of these. The first is that, that the following lifestyle changes are recommended in all patients with long QT. First, avoidance of QT prolonging drugs. And I should point out, every clinician should have this website. 
um, with them. Because when you have a patient with long QT, you really have to tell them that these are drugs that you avoid. None of us remember what the, all these drugs are, but that's why we have a website to refer patients to. And there's a number of over-the-counter drugs that are very important that can prolong the QT. Um, Correction of electrolyte abnormalities, this is obviously in the acute situation, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, hypocalcemia that can occur in the setting of diarrhea, vomiting, or metabolic conditions. And then avoidance of genotype-specific triggers for arrhythmias. And specifically, strenuous uh, swimming, such as especially in lung QT, one exposure to loud noises in lung QT2 patients. Uh, that's a little tricky to do. Um, so I, just in terms of these general lifestyle uh, sort of modifications. Gordon, maybe you could start off. Are there any specifics that you'd sort of tell us, uh, clinical pearls, in any of these patients? Well, uh, again, I want to thank everybody um, in the audience, and thank you for inviting me. It's been a real honor. I, 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 every one of my patients who have long QT syndrome, I tell them that lifestyle modification is really the foundation that you build the rest of therapy on, and uh, exactly what you said, make sure they have the crediblemeds.org website if there's, and I tell them if there's ever a question about a medicine that they've been given that they can't find, please call before taking it, and I'm happy to, uh, to help them work through that. And I also tell folks that people tend to sit at home and try and tough out intercurrent illnesses, gastrointestinal illnesses and the alike. I say, don't do that. If you can't keep food or fluids down, go get yourself seen, get plugged into an IV if necessary. And um, many patients I will put on supplemental magnesium and supplemental potassium, particularly if they don't have any renal failure, as kind of the lifestyle mm -hmm. baseline treatment for long QT syndrome. Uh, again, avoiding, avoiding triggers, specific triggers are more or less difficult. And I, I'm not sure, I don't think the answer's in about how rigorously we need to avoid triggers. In fact, we are enrolling patients in the, in the LIVE study which is trying to sort out based upon um, in patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and have long QT syndrome, who can exercise and how much they can exercise. They get a Fitbit when they get enrolled in this study and they get kind of regular follow-up uh, in terms of what they're doing um, with respect to uh, activity. It's very different than some other arrhythmic syndromes where we really very vigorously try to avoid exertion. Um, can I just ask, Amy, just in terms of um, genetic um, characterization of these patients. I mean, there's been a, a lot of work, obviously, in terms of genetic characterization of long QT phenotypes, and there's a number of different mutations. Um, we have long QT1 and 2 with mutations in uh, potassium channels, long QT3 with a mutation in the SCN5A, the sodium channel. And I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts in terms of how we apply this in terms of clinical practice? Um, is it important for us to genotype these patients from, in terms of uh, how we manage them clinically? That's a very broad question. I'm going to get into more detail, but just some high-level thoughts. I think, as I said um, in the last panel when we were talking about um, the importance of testing in cardiomyopathy, a similar principle applies. We're thinking not so much um, for the utility in the proband, but in their relatives. So I do advocate for genotyping in these cases, more so for how it impacts the care of relatives and the screening of relatives. So let me just, Gordon, I'll ask you to expand on that further. So that's characterization of relatives to see which patients, you know, which offspring, et cetera, have the mutation. Um, but what about the individual patient? I mean, does it matter? As you know, the, there's, some, there's some suggestion that long QT3, uh, for example, is more sensitive to sodium channel um, blockade. What, what are your thoughts in terms of using genotyping to treat the individual patient or modify how we treat the individual patient? Um, I, I think it can help in treating the proband. Uh, and I, there are diseases that are more Mendelian and less Mendelian. Long QT, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, CPVT, the yield of genetic testing is higher. It may be, it may be a little more specific than things like Brugada syndrome, dilated cardiomyopathy, early repolarization syndrome, and even ARVC. So I do think you get some useful information, particularly if it's one of those three out of 15 disease genes in long QT that are one of the top three because it can give you some idea of which triggers to avoid and what ancillary therapy might be useful. So for example, sodium channel blockers may be late sodium channel blockers, renolazine, eleclizine, although the trials have been held a little bit for, for eleclizine, might be useful in treating the late sodium current, which is characteristic of long QT syndrome type three. Mm -hmm. So I do believe that in fact, 
Genetic testing in those circumstances is justifiable, justifiable in the proband if there's a, a well-defined clinical indication that there's long QT syndrome because we have about a 70% chance of actually finding a disease gene. Is that the highest, by the way, of all the different conditions in terms of our ability to identify the mutation? It's, it's, it's pretty close to being the highest. About 60% of CPVT with uh, yeah. bona fide CPVT will have a mutation in mostly the ryanidine receptor, but, but that's, long QT is actually probably the, probably the best, wouldn't you say, Amy? Now, well, can I just ask you to comment? How often do you genotype patients in your clinical practice? And just talk about the practical aspects. <laughs> Particularly, I mean, we've had a, I've had a couple of patients where insurance has been less than receptive. Just yeah, what are your thoughts on this? Dr. Thomas Ali and I were talking about um, the guidelines versus reality. And when you're in a busy clinic, um, just approaching the subject is a hour commitment. And then after that, as you just said, the screening and actually whether it gets allowed, bringing in the back, it's a very big commitment. Um, so we have been probably doing less. I mean, I used to, when we had the long QT clinic, we started doing it and it became too complicated because the reality is it very rarely did anything clinically relevant to the patient. I mean, I, actually, not very rarely. I've never used it clinically that I didn't already know from the EKG or um, because we were already treating the beta blockers. So it's, it's kind of the out-of-the-box person you may need it for. And it, it brings a lot of uh, uh, stress to the patient, too, as soon as you start going down those lines. So we, we use it very little, um, except for uh, when, when there's really a good clinical story and you want it for the family. That's the biggest use. Family, yeah. So we do do it, we do do it but I don't actually use it very much. Amy, can you comment on the genetic counseling um, that really is sort of mandatory when we do genetic testing? and and some of the practical consideration. We as clinicians, what should we do if we have a long QT patient? Sure, and I think that what, what you're saying, Noel, is absolutely relevant um, to the reality of clinical practice, which is why actually Megan McNeil, who's in the audience now, she's our um, CVI genetic counselor who joined the, the faculty group um, in July, and she's available um, to see patients for specifically for genetic counseling and testing, and also is integrated into the cardiovascular genetics program practice, where um, physicians and counselors see the patients together. So those are anywhere from 60 to 90 minute visits, which is why I can appreciate um, the burden that it places on a regular cardio cardiology visit. But when it's a dedicated visit um, for discussing the intricacies of testing and doing all of the counseling, we're happy to accommodate. And I think a lot of institutions are moving to that model. So let's, um, let's move on to um, uh, some of the management uh, issues in this patient. And one of them, I'm just going to go to the next slide here, is this issue of the genotype positive, phenotype negative patients. So the patients, so we just did the genetic testing in our proband, and he had a patient had an offspring who uh, we tested and still is positive. But the QT is not um, prolonged. So the question is, what do you do with these patients? How do you re-stratify them? This is a manuscript from 2011 in Jack. It's an oldie but a goodie, because there are not too many others that have this kind of number of patients. This, was, uh, this included 3,386 genotype subject from seven multi-center uh, registries. So this is the largest, um, at least published database that I'm aware of. And they had three different groups. One are the unaffected family members, that is, those patients who uh, came back negative for the for the mutation. In red are the normal range QT patients, so QT, uh, long QT syndrome genotype positive patients, but no QT prolongation. And then the purple, the top line here, are the patients with long QT who had prolonged QTC. Now, the one thing you notice, of course, is patients who have long QT do worse in terms of the probability of recurrent arrhythmic event than those who don't. But the other thing you notice is that the red dotted line it doesn't, it is higher than the unaffected family members. So patients who are genotype positive, phenotype negative, um, do have an important risk of subsequent uh, rhythmic events. So Gordon, how do we risk stratify these patients? What are the things that you look at when you try to decide, well, this is a high risk long QT patient versus maybe not such a high risk patient? So um, I think there are a couple things. One, the personal history is really important. The length of the QT itself, so that it's directly proportional to the rate or the risk of having an arrhythmic event, so it's not, it's, it's not a binary decision. It's a, it's a continuous decision, and the longer the QT, the more likely it is that you're going to have a problem. I think 
Um, those two things and um, people straying from uh, accepted therapy and also getting into problems with other things that would further prolong the QT. Uh, specifically, that happens to be medicines most of the time, but the development of other forms of cardiac disease, whether it's hypertensive heart disease, coronary heart disease, just complicates the management of patients with long QT syndrome. So those are the things that I look at. I, and, I, and again, the longer the QT gets, the more anxious I am about the QT interval, the more I demand that the patient be on therapy, the more I'll push uh, supplementary potassium, supplementary mag magnesium. Um, but even those who have a normal QT, who, have, who are harboring a disease-causing gene, remember, the QT is an evanescent kind of thing. And the fact that it's normal today doesn't mean it's going to be normal tomorrow. 25% of patients who have bona fide disease-causing genes will have a normal QT interval at any given point in time, but may have, in fact, a longer QT later. Patients need to kind of understand that particular piece of it as well. I would say a couple of other things about the genetics. One is that in our clinic, we never do a genetic test without our genetic counselor. It's not just a matter of time. It's a matter of the right practice, because mm -hmm. you know we, we as, as cardiologists, know most of the right things to say. The genetic counselors are professionals at this, and they do a much better job than we do. Second is, a genetic test can be a test of a, of a gene base pair change, but a genetic test in a family that's got long QT syndrome could be an electrocardiogram, and you need to understand that. So if somebody says, I don't want to know my genotype, well, if they come in and their parent or their sibling has long QT mm -hmm. and a gene abnormality and you get an electrocardiogram and their QT is long, well, they've been genotyped. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think these are all things that we need to kind of keep in mind when we're, when we're focusing on patients who have a genetic disease that's got a functional manifestation that you can actually see in another test. Um, one other thing that I thought was very interesting was the interaction between gender and uh, risk. That is... Um, uh, females over the age of 18, uh, I'm sorry, over the age of 13 seem to have a higher risk of subsequent events. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? What is the physiology behind this? That's to you, Gordon. <laughs> so this is hotly debated, whether it's uh, absence of testosterone, more estrogen, some combination of the above or something else, because it seems to be uh, after, um, after menarche and uh, not so much after menopause if you make it that long. Repolarizing reserves tends to be uh, reduced in women of childbearing age for some reason. There are many of ex many explanations that we have that relate to the density of, of particular kinds of potassium currents that might contribute to repolarization. Uh, uh, men typically have a worse time with virtually all other forms of cardiac disease, except for long QT syndrome, when uh, women um, tend to have more problems than, than men do, and I think that's something to keep in mind uh, mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're thinking about risk and somebody's risk of, uh, of having an arrhythmic event. Okay, I want to go back to the, the other slide and just, again, look at... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I just want a quick addition. Peripartum is very important. Yep, that's right. Because so that, they really can change a lot around their pregnancy. So to that point, let me just ask you, Noel, since you brought it up, what is the, so in a, in a patient, um, the peripartum patient who has long QT and just got longer, what's, what do we do in those patients? Um, we're going to talk about beta blockers and the role of beta blockers, but is this the kind of patient that we should consider wearable therapy, wearable defibrillator, et cetera? Having sadly lost such a patient once, um, I do think it's actually a good idea. Actually, I didn't really lose such a patient, but I was referred one that died before I saw her. Um, um, so I do think that's an option, um, again, based on the, the QT. But uh, uh, the other thing is they lose their sleep. They are not well hydrated because they're breastfeeding. They're not beta blocked. So there's a lot of teaching that can be done around that period, which is why I was raising it. OK, so in terms of treatment, uh, there are two class one recommendations in the guidelines for these uh, long QT patients. One is the treatment of, with beta blockers. That's recommended in all uh, long QT syndrome patients. The second is ICD implantation with the use of beta blockers in long QT syndrome patients with previous cardiac arrest. Now, if we look at, and then if we look at the other patients, beta blockers should be considered in the carriers of causative long QT mutation, but normal QT intervals. So these are the genotype positive, phenotype negative patients. So that's a two-way recommendation. And then ICD implantation, in addition to, be, in addition to beta blockers, 
should be considered in long QT patients who experience syncope and or VT while receiving an adequate dose of beta blockers. The, the other point I want to make is that um, there's, no, there's nothing, oh, I'm sorry, right here. Implantation of ICD may be considered in addition to beta blocker therapy in asymptomatic patients with the pathogenic mutation KCNH2 or KCN, uh, KCN5A when the QT is longer than 500. So now we're talking about looking at long QT, specific long QT patients with particularly long QT uh, in asymptomatic patients considering ICD. Now, this is a 2B recommendation, but I have a feeling that this 2B recommendation is one of those that's utilized quite frequently in clinical practice. And so I just wanted to, so Bill, maybe I can ask you this question. Who are the, are there any QTC patients longer than 500 that you don't consider an ICD, or that you don't put an ID? I mean, you can consider anything, but how, I guess my question is, this 2B recommendation, how often do you think you engage that and put an ICD in these patients? To be honest, I would, um, I haven't put an ICD in that, in an asymptomatic patient with, uh, with a mutation uh, and, a, and a prolonged QT if they're truly asymptomatic. And I think um, I tend to follow the practice more. These are European recommendations, right? I would have thought they the are, but the U.S. More. recommendations are probably yeah. similar. I mean, the U.S. recommendations last since we had were 2013, so it's been a while, unfortunately. Hopefully that'll change. It, I mean, I... I yeah. Coming this year, okay. Having experienced the uh, the complications of ICD implant in other patients, you know, without Q prolonged QT, I wouldn't do it in somebody who's asymptomatic. Uh, oh, that's it. So that's a different uh, answer than I expected. Um, Noel, would you like to comment? I, I would agree, uh, except when they're like over 580. Like when they get super except long, what? When they get super long, then I will consider it. What, what do you mean by super long? I said 580. 580. Yeah. Gordon, what are your comments on this? Uh, I would generally agree, particularly if it's long QT1, I would not put in a, def not put in a defibrillator treat with beta blockers. There are some things that worry me, um, not only the length of the QT, but macroscopic QT alternance is something that uh, is already telling me that there's a, a variability in the electrical substrate and that we're kind of teetering near an edge that might be of some concern. This is where, in fact, genotyping may be helpful under some circumstances. You know, what is the mutation? Where is it? Is it a dominant negative? What gene is it in? Um, and that, that might, um, in the context, not somebody who's truly asymptomatic, but somebody who's got a, you know, why did they come to me? Maybe it, oftentimes it's a family member that's had mm -hmm. an event. And a single family member is also not supposed to sway your decision. But if you have multiple family members, it's not long QT1 then there are things that uh, might make me consider uh, an ICD, a sub-Q, subcutaneous ICD, for yeah, example. Increasingly. One that uh, uh, might be something that if And what about QT3, long QT3? Yeah. Does uh, that make you uh, more concerned? Because long QT3 patients are considered a higher risk. Y well, they're, like so they, they actually have... They actually have an over, overall lower event rate, but the events are worse. Yeah. So the events tend to be not syncope, but sudden death. And they do uh, worry me. And you know the options are to treat with uh, a sodium channel blocking drug, like uh, mexilotine or like ranolazine. Uh, we, ha we don't have the data to suggest that those do anything other than shorten the QT. We don't know whether or not they improve outcome. There just hasn't been enough of those patients to really study them effectively. Mm -hmm. Again, truly asymptomatic. I'm a little bit hesitant to put in a defibrillator, but, um, but again, it's, it's really kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, so let's, um, let's look at beta blocker treatment. That's something that I think everybody agrees these patients should be on, whether or not they receive, a beta, uh, receive an ICD. So one interesting question is what kind of beta blocker? And um, this, is, um, this is a Heart Rhythm article recently. Just, you see the front page. And this was basically prompted by the recent discontinuation of Nadalol in the, in, uh, in the United Kingdom. And so this raised the question of how important the type of beta blocker used in, um, in long QT as well as um, uh, catechomorgic polymorphic VT patients, which we'll get to. So if you look at this next slide, I just want to point to two different papers. Now, I've got to start off by pointing out that there's no randomized data, as you'd expect. There's no randomized data of different beta blocker use in long QT patients. There's not enough patients. I mean, you can't even, I can't even imagine doing such a study. 
But there are some interesting retrospective studies. This is a study published in JAK in 2012. This is one of two studies where they looked at 382 long QT1 and long QT2 patients who were initiated on beta blockers. And what you see, um, the percent of patients who subsequently developed some sort of breakthrough events, um, uh, VT, whatever, what appeared to be lower, I'm sorry, appeared to be higher with metoprolol than with natalol and propanolol. So natalol and propanolol seem to work equally well as compared to metoprolol. Now, and if you go to the next slide, this is sort of interesting. Here they looked at the effect of beta blockers on QT interval. And interestingly, in the patients who had prolonged QT interval, propanolol shown here in blue seemed to cause a decrease in the QT interval. It's not really clear to me how that happens. Gore, do you have any, any understanding of the mechanism behind why this would be? This is somewhat controversial, by the way, whether or not the beta blocker would actually reduce the QT interval. But if it did, why would it have? Yeah, so s some of this uh, data requires pushing the dose of beta blockers to the point where they become channel blocking drugs. And then you'd have to argue that, that, that what they're doing is they're blocking a a depolarizing current like sodium current or calcium current. Now, the other thing that happens with calcium currents is adrenergic stimulation increases calcium current, therefore will mm -hmm. prolong the QT interval on that basis alone. So it's a bit hand-waving, but probably those things are, are contributing to the overall shortening of the, of the QT interval. Now, this is also a QTC, and the correction is not linear. Sure. So if you're slowing the heart rate down a lot, you may actually shorten the QTC without really shortening mm -hmm. the QT itself. So Got I it. think that probably a number of things are at play here. Um, some of them may be, may be important for managing um, uh, the, electro, the electrophysiological phenomena of QT mm -hmm. prolongation. Others may be uh, less so. OK, so we have one paper that suggests that natalol and propanolol work equally well compared to metoprolol. And then the other paper that I'm aware of, this is a, a larger study, again, looking at long QT, one and two patients who are genotype positive, 1,530 patients from the Rochester long QT syndrome uh, registry who are prescribed beta blockers. And what I'll point you to is two interesting things. If you look in long QT1 and just look at the hazard ratios, what you see is that all of the drugs seem to work pretty well. The hazard ratio is around 0.4 to 0.5 with all of the drugs in terms of the chance of decreasing cardiac events. If you look on the right side, what you see in long QT uh, syndrome 2 patients, only NADLAW was statistically significantly uh, able to reduce subsequent um, events. So this suggests that NADLAW is better than the other drugs, at least for long QT2. And let's just go to the next slide. The other interesting thing that was sort of hard to put together is if you look at patients, again, the same population, you look at the cumulative prob probability of subsequent cardiac event among patients with one cardiac event. So these are patients who had an event, a cardiac uh, uh, event, and then the question of subsequent event. What you see is the drugs seem to work all relatively equivalently, except propanolol didn't do as well here. So, oh, I'm sorry. So the question, I guess, with, with, these different, um, with these different studies is, what do we do with this information? Do we believe that it matters which, um, which beta blocker that we use? Any thoughts on this? Gordon, do you want to start off with this? So again, as you pointed out, we, we don't have a lot of randomized trial data to base this on. In sitting in the guidelines uh, sessions, the largest, the loudest voices in the room basically said a non-selective, <laughs> long-acting beta blocker of some kind, which really was propranolol if it's hydrophobic, natalol if it's hydrophilic. So some people, in fact, might, for whatever reason, you might want to use a drug that's cleared by the kidney as opposed by the liver. So there are rare patients who have debrisiquin deficiency, for example. But, but other than that, I think that those are the two that have been recommended. And in fact, I think the guidelines document recommended those two for people who are symptomatic. And if you had to use a beta-1 selective like metoprolol, you could do so in patients who are carriers but were not symptomatic. Uh, 
So I don't, have a, I don't have a good answer. There's a lot of variability here. I'd love to know what the baseline QT interval was of the groups yeah. that are treated here. I'd like to know what was not just the genotype, but the specific mutation. Because you can imagine that there are a number of intersecting circles here. These are overlapping Venn diagrams of type of mutation, QT interval, a, a host of other things that might influence the specific curves in relatively small numbers of patients. So to that point, let's look at long QT3. This is, a, this is recently published in circulation this past year. Um, again, because long QT3 is the least common of all the mutations. This is the mutation in the sodium channel, uh, reflecting about, I think it's about 10% of the total long QT cohort. And what you see, actually, let me go to the slide that says influence of QTC on timing of cardiac event. What you see is a long QT3 patients who have a QTC less than 450, compared to those 450 to 490, compared to those 500 or higher, you can see a significant change in subsequent events. Um, and one interesting comment, though, at least in this study, beyond 500, there didn't really seem to make, it didn't really seem to make a difference. And I don't know if the numbers are too small. Or, it, does that make sense to have a threshold that once you get a QTC that's beyond a certain number that you wouldn't expect any change in risk? Gordon? Um, I don't know if it... I don't know if it makes sense or not, but I think uh, uh, one of the issues is what's the dynamic behavior of the QT. So for example, in long QT3, rather than the QT interval prolonging with increasing heart rate, it actually shortens. And sometimes you put these people on a treadmill and it hyper acutely shortens. So up to a point that might be actually mm -hmm. good, reduces repolarization reserve. May also be an explanation why disproportionately patients with long QT3 experience events at rest or during sleep. Um, but it's, I, think it's, I think it's not just the length of the QT. You know, we intentionally prolong the QT a lot with amiodarone, and it's not just the QT prolongation that we're interested in. We're interested in homogenizing the length of the action potential throughout the ventricle to make uh, functional reentry less likely, polymorphic VT less likely. Mm -hmm. So um, if, you look at, if you look at the distribution of sodium currents in ventricular heart cells, probably a little less variable than some of the potassium currents. Mm -hmm. So this, I mean, this might be a reason why you tolerate a little bit longer QT if it's a late, if it's a late sodium current um, in, uh, in long QT3, if there's not such a dramatic change, because it may, there may be an index of less heterogeneity. So one other very important aspect of this paper was the demonstration that beta blockers did seem to help, that beta blockers did decrease subsequent events. And minimally, in long QT3 patients, beta blockers didn't worsen the prognosis. I want to skip forward a little bit in the interest of time. This is an interesting question, the role of um, sodium channel blocking agents specifically in uh, long QT3 patients. So there was an interesting study. It was just published in Circarrhythmia this year. It, it was combined both an experimental arm taking cells that were um, taken from a patient who expressed uh, this particular mutation in uh, the sodium channel, as well as a clinical study of seven patients, long QT3, uh, with the same mutation. And these patients were uh, given renolazine. And what you see on this bar graph, these are the individual patients, and with the administration of renolazine, there was a decrease in the QTC. Um, it, there was, there's older data in terms of use of mexilatine, again, for the same purpose, decrease in the QTC um, and long QT3 patients. Bill, what do you think about this data? I know that you like ranolazine, so what are your thoughts on sodium, specific sodium channel blockade in these kind of patients? I mean, it's really exciting that you can treat, you know, grow, in medical school, at least the uh, impression was that long QT would really required um, device therapy in, in the symptomatic patients, especially. And, and uh, it, it's been exciting to see some of the data with the sodium channel blockers. And, and the renolazine, the study is consistent with, with uh, other studies of flecainide uh, for long QT3 from uh, Dr. Moss that showed, um, you know, improved outcomes with, in, in that particular uh, group of patients. So. Um, I don't know why renolazine would be any better than flecainide, um, but, uh, you know, it is, it does seem to have a lot of applications, uh, uh, including AFib. <laughs> um, Gordon, any comment on renolazine specifically as an agent compared to Mex or one of the other agents? Um, 
I, I, there are a couple of things that are theoretically uh, theoretically favorable differences. One, it's the um, the IC50 for block of late versus peak sodium currents a little bit more favorable for renolazine and late so sodium current as opposed to peak. The other thing that uh, renolazine does, all antiarrhythmic drugs at a high enough dose will block all channels. They've all evolved from the same molecule. The bu drug mm -hmm. binding sites are similar, but flecainide actually has a really high propensity to block to block ITO, to block a potassium current that may alter the plateau in ways that in some cases might be favorable and in other ways is, that might not be favorable. So I think that flecainide's not one that I would use, although you're right, Art, Art's demonstrated that that drug will shrink the QT interval in patients with long QT3, as will mixilatine. Um, I think renolazine or aleclizine is, is more designed to be a drug that seems to target a particular current that we're interested in being a pathologic, or think is a pathologic current, so that might be the one that I might favor if I were gonna use one of these drugs. So when I put all this together in terms of the beta blocker, it seems like everyone, most people agree that uh, natalol is the best choice if it can be, if it can be used. Um, and then if, there, if it's another agent, it basically the idea is to use long, as you said, long-acting agents, uh, non-selective. But there's a lot of data that suggests that compliance with beta blocker use is not so great. And I'm asking about this specifically because you know, there's a therapy that's been around for a long time, which is um, sympathetic um, denervation, so cardiac stellate ganglion um, resection. This is a, a minimally invasive surgical procedure that the thoracic surgeons do. And I'm wondering, what is the role of that? I mean, I can tell you in our practice, there have been patients where um, they've had long QT for even drug-induced long QT, or um, you know, patients, uh, methadone patients, for example. Um, who had long QT, couldn't get a defibrillator for infectious reasons, and that we've done this. But we do this very sparingly. And I'm wondering, um, uh, let me start with you, Noel. What, what do you think about the role? How come we don't do it very often? Who should we do this in? Who are the patients that would most likely benefit? I, I think we don't do it a lot because it's not, uh, for obviously any invasive thing is harder mm -hmm. to convince people. I actually have had very good success with Natalol in, mm -hmm. in the, even the younger patients. I think that's one reason the studies may show that it does better because uh, we get decent compliance, surprisingly. Um, and But I think it's just because it's not something we think a lot of and it may make sense. Uh, clearly, anything that we can't undo, we like less than things that we can. So a surgical mm -hmm. procedure that's not reversible is always a bit of a worry. So I think that's part of the reason it hasn't made more headway. Gordon, what are your thoughts? What's the Hopkins practice like, particularly with regard to uh, stellate ganglia resection? So we certainly don't use it as first-line therapy. Um, and the reason is, is somebody's got to be good at doing it and doing it right without producing... Horner syndrome or some other complication uh, mm -hmm. of that resection. We've actually been trying to do even more minimally invasive um, VATS-based uh, injection and, uh, and ablation mm -hmm. of ganglia. Um, Hari Tandri and our group's working with uh, Kashuk Mandel to, to, get this, to get this going. And if, if, you know, this is in early days, but we, I can envision using this more um, if, if, in fact, it's a reliable procedure that's even you know, less invasive. I mean, minimally invasive surgery is surgery done on somebody else, actually. But, but I mean, <laughs> you know, even more minimally invasive than, than the thor thoroscopic kind of uh, uh, cervical resection. The other thing I would say is my experience with Natalol has been the same as yours. It's been people have tolerated it better than propranolol. And my sense is that this may be because it's a hydrophilic drug and not a hy hydrophobic drug, and it doesn't get into the central nervous system as much, and people complain less of nightmares and some of the other profound lethargy that uh, some folks get on propranolol. So natalol has been a good choice. It's long-acting, it's hydrophilic, and um, patients have tolerated it well. But if that fails, particularly if somebody has an event, either with a defibrillator in place or on a drug, um, um, then, then we, we would move to some uh, surgical intervention. OK, I want to move on to um, this article. I'm not going to go through this article in detail. This was published in JAMA last year. And it was an interesting article looking at over 2,000 patients um, from this uh, genomics network, pharmacogenomics project at seven academic centers. And they were looking at SCN5A and KCNH2 mutations, the mutations long QT and Brigada, uh, in patients and trying to understand basically what are pathologic and what are mutations that are just, you know, whatever variants. 
and, and just cut to the chase, they, they, in their experience, there was a very high rate of, um, of, patient, of uh, mutations that were not clinically relevant. And I'm just wondering, Amy, as you look forward, you know, there's a lot of interest, as you know, in trying to characterize patients who may not overtly express one of these phenotypes, but may be at high risk for developing either drug-induced torsade or whatever. And can you talk about what are the challenges with, um, the, in terms of doing genetic testing, and how do you differentiate between the pathologic and the, and the variant? Sure. Um, so one of the advances in the last few years has been the development of panel testing. So we no longer have to identify from the get-go what specific genes we're interested in looking at if we're mm -hmm. thinking type 1 versus type 2 or 3, um, if there's any ambiguity or really the practice now has generally been that we do the panel on everyone. Um, and, you know, for long QT, we would do the panel of all the genes. The interpretation um, is such that the result is either for um, the negative result, there's no mutation seen, or there's a variant that's found that can either be um, associated as pathogenic or likely pathogenic or uncertain significance. And the distinction is whether it's been documented in other families or um, in, a, in the literature um, in association with the phenotype. If not, usually it, it falls into that basket of uncertain significance. And then there are certain um, algorithms in silico analysis that can be used to predict whether or not um, it's likely to cause a functional effect. Mm -hmm. But still, usually we don't d rely on in silico data to make a final determination. And that's where um, doing... Um, um, you know, the, the studies in, the, in relatives who might be affected as well to do the segregation analysis and see whether we can upgrade um, the status of the variant is very helpful. In silico analysis alone, usually we can't do that, and then we're left with an uncertain um, result, and the patients usually struggle um, in those cases. And, and that's another area where genetic counseling becomes extremely helpful. Um, I want to move on to sports, because this is a really interesting issue. And if we look at the sort of the guidelines in long QT patients over time, things have fortunately evolved a little bit. Uh, 2005, the, and, well, actually, let's start with the Bethesda conference in 2005. The, the recommendation at that time were that all males with a QTC late, late, greater than 470 or females with a QTC greater than 480, uh, regardless of whether or not they were phenotype negative or positive, should basically um, be restricted only to class 1A sports. The European Society of Cardiology uh, recommendations, which came out in the same year, were actually even more restrictive. That basically said all sports should be restricted. Now, more recently, there was a task force in 2015, which um, uh, most recent uh, guidelines, again, looking at males over the QTC greater than 470 or females over 480. And uh, what they basically came out with is that in patients who, have, who are phenotype negative, there should be no restriction in sports, so if the QTC is normal. But if the QTC, if the patient's symptomatic, I mean, elevated long QTC, there should be no restrictions except for long QT1 swimmers. Uh, and you must be asymptomatic for the three months prior to therapy. So my question, actually, to the panel is, how do you implement, I mean, these are, this is obviously a shifting um, uh, baseline. I'm wondering, how do you implement this in clinical practice? Bill, what are your thoughts in terms of exercise in, uh, in these patients. Actually, I'm sorry, let me um, actually direct this to Robert. This is what I was going to ask you, Robert. In your read of the literature, what do you, what do you see and, um, uh, in terms of um, the, how we should be restricting these patients? Uh, well, thank you for your question. I, one of the things that was so uh, educational for me and somewhat surprising was that the statements for uh, these patients with long QT seem pretty uh, blanket statements and there does seem to be heterogeneity based on what the type of long QT is, mm -hmm. uh, with exercise uh, having less risk in patients with long QT3, perhaps, um, certainly less than long QT type 1. So I think, you know, as with all clinical decisions, it involves discussion with the patient and what their values and preferences are. And, you know, if this is somebody who uh, athletics are a big part of their happiness in life, then right. I think it's a good uh, situation for genetic testing to further help risk stratify. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt. There have been studies that have been done looking at the psychological well-being of these patients, and it's not trivial to restrict them from activities. But you raise a good point. You know, these kind of guidelines that are relatively broad strokes are by definition going to be too restrictive in some population and not restrictive enough in other populations. 
So let me ask, um, uh, let me start with Gordon. How, can, can we use genotyping in this, for this particular purpose of trying to determine which patients should be allowed to exercise? And does the presence of an ICD, should that affect how we make these recommendations? First part of your question, I don't know that we, we can use genotyping explicitly to make this kind of decision, because I think many things factor into it other than the genotype. There are going to be genotypes that you know are going to cause more in the way of problems. And it may, if you absolutely, and the patient and their family feels like exercise and competitive sports or whatever it is is part of their life, you may be more likely to say, okay, we will allow you to, and I've done this, allow you to participate. There must be an AED at every practice and every game somebody there trained to use it mm -hmm. and then go ahead. Um, or we put in a defibrillator and, uh, and move forward. Again, depends upon the level, the level of risk. I do think that for many sports, participating with a defibrillator is okay. I took care of a minor league baseball player who had a, who had a problem and had a defibrillator and the issue for him was he did a lot of head first sliding and uh, the time, the four years that I knew him, he had three, needed three new leads. So, so um, I, I think the level, the, the particular activities are also really important. Um, most sports are okay. The sports where even a transient loss of consciousness is a problem, I think should be restricted um, uniformly. Rock climbing, skydiving, mm -hmm. um, and I've had people, and I also have um, uh, a woman who I take care of who was a, 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 a glider pilot. Um, and I suggested that that might not be the, the wisest, uh, wisest <laughs> thing to do because she was up there on her own. Basically, these were single-person gliders that she, that she flew. So um, I, I think it's a matter of what the activity is, what the risk tolerance is of the person, what things can be done to kind of ameliorate that risk and care for that patient immediately should they get into problems. But I think we have historically been a little too restrictive, but, but that's because the price that you pay can be a really steep price. Let me move to, um, Bill, I just want to um, direct you to, to this slide. This is actually over a decade old. The observation by several different um, groups that some of these patients, both long QT as well as uh, Brigada syndrome, they present with these PVCs that initiate the onset of VF. And that, um, uh, and that importantly, that catheter ablation of these PVCs actually seems to decrease subsequent uh, therapy. Um, we don't do this very often in clinical practice, though. It's, uh, this is a relatively infrequent, um, uh, infre just because we don't see this phenomenon of lots of frequent PVCs that are the same morphology. Um, actually, I don't really have a question to ask you. <laughs> I'm going to move on. I really want to get to CPVT, because I think this is... I mean, like, I think it's interesting with all these guidelines, like how they'll change with the, the uh, implantable monitoring um, that's become so much more prevalent, and we'll probably yeah. be able to detect these triggers more frequently. You know, it'll, people are probably um, monitoring their patients differently now with some of these syndromes. Yeah, that's a great question. I actually have a slide later on to try to, but so let's just talk about that since you brought it up. Um, and actually, I'll direct this to Noel. So, Noel, how should ILRs impact our management of these patients? What are the things that you're thinking about? I mean, it's obviously too early. We don't have any data yet, yeah, but... I mean, the, the next generation of ILRs are actually going to talk to your cell phone so that they will actually be active as opposed so to... So we now. get the data immediately? Is that what correct. you're telling me? Oh, That's great. Correct. More data to look yeah. at immediately. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. so, I mean, the, one of the problems is then it's putting things in a little too early because then you're committed to less good technology and it's really accelerating rapidly. So in terms of the sub-Q, for example, that's another issue. You put a sub-Q now, it's going to be very different in two years. There'll be remote monitoring that's going to help a lot on a lot of these issues. But I do think it's going to be very interesting, and I really think we need, you know, what's interesting, we're saying we're restricting people. It's not really going to be our job to restrict. It's going to be our job to give data that allows them to make their choices. I mean, some of us do marathon, not mm -hmm. me. Some people do marathons, some people climb mountains, and some people do things that have risk. So we, our real role is going to be ultimately trying to define better who is at risk and give them a risk and say, do it or don't do it. It's up to you. So Gordon, at Hopkins, are you guys using ILRs for the, uh, in these patients, and how do you use them if so? So I would say the majority of ILRs these days are referrals from our neurology colleagues. Yeah, same here. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> Uh, and I would say that one of the cautionary tales here is we need to know how the normal 
patient with an ILR looks like, because I suspect that uh, we will see a lot of arrhythmias that, that maybe concern us mm -hmm. in people who have absolutely no risk at all that we would consider a risk of dying suddenly, including ventricular tachyarrhythmias that are self-terminating. So I, 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 I do think that there's a role. I think we need to understand what the denominator is, though, and we don't yet. So let's move on to CPVT. Um, Catapomologic uh, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia is a condition that's typically um, related to mutations in the riandin receptor, the calsequestrin, it destroys that word, calsequestrin gene. Um, it, it's an abnormality of calcium handling, and these are patients who are exquisitely sensitive to uh, exercise or high catechol states. So they end up demonstrating ventricular arrhythmias, particularly in the context of exercise. And we oftentimes use, ex and actually, let's just talk about the, the evaluation of these patients. So, um, Bill, do you want to just talk about how do these patients typically present and, um, and some of the evaluation? I mean, I've had like maybe two patients in my 10 years of practice with this, but I mean. Very rare condition. Usually uh, what I've seen is um, some exercise in, induced syncope, so we'll try to reproduce it on the, on the treadmill, and it usually is reproducible. And some, it's typically in somebody who's already got a defibrillator, or at least those are the patients I've seen, somebody who's already diagnosed with it. Yeah, I mean, these are patients who oftentimes you exercise them, they'll demonstrate either they start with bigeminy and then eventually polymorphic VT or VT runs. Uh, they don't tend to be monomorphic VT. They really are polymorphic VT. Now, in terms of the lifestyle changes, the class one recommendation, as you'd expect, is avoid competitive sports, strenuous exercise, and structural environments to the extent that one can. Beta blockers are definitely recommended in these patients. Um, that's a class one recommendation. And ICD implantation is also a class one recommendation in patients with CPVT who experience a clinical event, cardiac arrest, syncope, or um, bidirectional VT despite optimal therapy. Now, beta blockers are considered as a 2A recommendation in patients who are gen genotype positive but have a negative exercise test, an exercise um, uh, stress test. Now, the other interesting thing, again, are some of these other agents. So, flecainide. Um, uh, Gordon, can you talk about the role of flecainide in your CPVT patients? Yes, so um, I actually use flecainide quite a bit in this group. I, I follow maybe seven or eight families that have CPVT, uh, all of them ryanidine receptor mutations. Uh, invariably, there's a risk of sudden death in each, uh, or the presence of sudden death in each one of these families. Um, and I try to, when possible, it's, it, the, the variability is actually quite interesting. I have one very large family, 16-year-old girl, passed out twice and died suddenly playing tug of war. Uh, and uh, the usual course of events is I see a family member of a pro band uh, more frequently than I actually see the patient themselves. Her sister had lots of, lots of PVCs on the treadmill. We gave her beta blockers and couldn't suppress them, and she was feeling terrible on beta blockers. So. As a, uh, as a beta blocker, blocking, blocker sparing kind of therapy, I added flecainide, mm. was able to drop her dose of beta blocker and completely clean up her Holter now, I mean her exercise test now. Um, she's done well, I don't know, and, and subsequently had twins, and one of the, twin, the twins are affected too, but, but she's, done, she's done very well on a combination of flecainide and beta blockers, so I will use those together oftentimes when I can't push beta blockers far enough as solo therapy. The other thing that I've actually had work as well as calcium channel blockers like in, in, uh, like uh, verapamil or diltiazem mm -hmm. in combination with beta blockers as well. Uh, again, just like with, uh, with long QT syndrome, there is some data, albeit limited, in terms of uh, whether to use a selective agent or a non-selective agent. This I thought was a very interesting study. It was published in Heart Rhythm this year. They, did a, they took a number of patients, I think it was like 60-some patients, and they gave these patients, they looked at their heart rate at baseline versus giving them six weeks of a selective beta blocker versus six weeks of Nadolol. Again, each patient served their own control. What you see is that resting, their heart rates are relatively similar, but with exercise, Nadolol was the most effective in terms of decreasing the heart rate. That's the first thing. And coincident with that, if you look on the right, with, if you look at the percent of patients that develop some sort of an arrhythmia during the exercise test, Nadolol patients, the Nadolol patients did the best. So green represents no arrhythmias or single PVCs only. Yellow represents uh, high frequency of extra stimuli, uh, I'm sorry, of ventricular extras. 
This is couplets, and then red is non-stain BT. And you see, at least in this single center study, but at least each patient served as their own control, uh, Nadlaw does appear to be the most effective. But again, I think the recommendation, data support, but the safety of the highest tolerated dosage uh, indicate the potential to double the standard recommend regimen. Oh, wait, I read this wrong. The point is that you should use the highest dose of a beta blocker in these patients. Um, should we test these? Should we exercise all these patients? Yeah? Everybody says yes. It certainly makes sense to me. Um, so, Marty, how much time do we have? Ten minutes. Okay. That's enough time to go through all of Brigada syndrome, I think. Um, so, Brigada syndrome, uh, we want to move on to this. So, Brigada syndrome, all of us know um, what it is. And I guess one question is, in terms of... Um, Actually, let me, let me go forward to this. Okay, in terms of how to deal with these patients, again, we'll start off with lifestyle changes. One is, the, again, the avoidance of drugs that may induce ST elevation, the precordial leads, avoidance of excessive alcohol intake or large meals, and prompt treatment of any fever with antipyretic agents. Uh, and that's a very important one, I think. Um, Gordon, do you want to talk about the physiology of that, the pathophysiology? of fever, and actually this extends to other things like hot tubs and et cetera, right? Yeah, so increasing core temperature can, can actually change and steepen the, what's presumed to be the transmural on the right ventricle um, gradient of uh, dispersion of repolarization. So making sure that, and it's not just antipyretics, but making sure you're well hydrated because that's as good a way to bring your core temperature down as antipyretics. And it has to do with the Q10 for block of these various currents. So, so we're, we're pretty aggressive about making sure that people uh, uh, treat, uh, treat fevers aggressively with both antipyretics and a combination of fluids. And you're exactly right. It's, it's increasing core temperature in any way that's exercising in the heat, sitting in a hot tub. Those kinds of things can actually lead to, uh, can lead to arrhythmias and Brugada syndrome. Brugada is one of those that's a little bit difficult from the standpoint of the genetics. It's one of those that behaves more like an oligogenetic disease rather than a truly Mendelian genetic disease. There have been 17 different genes that have been associated with Brugada to date. The only one that really has is, is, is been linked very tightly is mutations in SCN5A. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been a number of others that have been linked and linked with reasonable data, but the only one that really is kind of a, a, a solid foundation of disease causing is SCN5A, and that's a those are loss of function mutations as opposed to gain of function mutations. And then there's this other funny piece where there are mutations that actually produce both things. So some combination of Brugada and long QT. I think this makes this really challenging from the genetic point of view. It makes it really challenging to do what we call cascade genetic testing. Mm -hmm. So somebody has a mutation, trying to figure out who's at risk in the family. Their variant segregates or doesn't segregate with a phenotype that may or may not be present because these ECGs, if you think long QT ECGs are difficult to sort out, these are even more difficult to sort out. And we routinely in clinic measure ECG in standard position and two interspaces above just, mm -hmm. just to, to see whether or not we can see any, any problem with early uh, uh, depolarization. Now, in terms of the treatment of these patients, unlike long QT where there's a lot of data in terms of beta blockers, with Brigada patients, we don't really have that much data in terms of therapy, pharmacologic therapy. There is some data with quinidine, relatively small studies showing that quinidine, because of its ITO blocking effect, does seem to normalize the, the EKG. But if you look at the recommendations, ICD implantation is recommended for patients with Brigada who, who are either survivors of a cardiac arrest or have documented spontaneous sustained um, tachycardia. ICD should be, that's a class one recommendation. Now, as a class two rec, 2A recommendation, the ICD should be considered in patients with spontaneous type one ECG and a history of, um, uh, and a history of uh, syncope. So what do we do with the rest of those patients? The, the, um, the Brigada patients who don't have spontaneous type one, let's say, um, who don't have a history of, uh, a personal history of, of, a, of a ventricular arrhythmia. Are these the kind of patients we should be considering ILRs? Um, what should we, uh, uh, Noel, do you want to opine on this? Can I start there? I'm just thinking about your ILR question. Um, I mean, right now I just treat them with what we were just talking about, giving them lots of recommendations of how to, to prevent things and look in their family members and obviously have uh, easy ways to reach us if they all have new symptoms. I've never thought of the ILR. I mean, I don't think the ILR is quite ready for that at this point. 
Okay. Um, Amy, do you want to have positives and false negatives? And we really can drive these people nuts by raising their worry of what they're actually dealing with. We drive ourselves nuts, too, by looking at all those tracings. Sorry, Amy, go ahead. No, just to the electrophysiologist on the panel, how often do you do provocative testing? Yeah, so I'm going to get to that. It's an area of controversy, um, certainly. Um, let me just show you one uh, important paper. This was published in Circulation uh, this past year, actually. Um, so just for the audience, there's been a sort of a, this uh, running argument in, the, in our field and as to the role of electrophysiology testing, that is program stimulation in Brigada syndrome. Um, Brigada and Brigada and Brigada have felt that, that um, program stimulation has been very useful. And then Sylvia Priori and, and, other, and her um, group of investigators have felt that program stimulation has not been particularly useful beyond the clinical history of personal history of syncope, et cetera. So this was a paper that was published in circulation um, from, uh, I think this is from Sylvia Priori and others in a group. And what they looked at was if you look at these four graphs, and just look at them very quickly. So these are patients who had syncope and a spontaneous ECG pattern in A. In B, it's syncope and drug-induced pattern, that is, giving adjuvaline or something to induce the ST elevation. Uh, in C, is asymptomatic with spontaneous ECG, and then B is asymptomatic with the drug-induced ECG. And I, if we just concentrate on A, for example, you see that the induced patients, patients who had positive EP study shown on a dotted line, had a somewhat higher event rate than patients that didn't. However, patients that were not induced had a very high event rate, and that's the problem. And the, ne the negative predictive value of EP study is just not terribly high. So now it does seem to be, and I, I put a box over here, patients that are induced with single or double extra stimuli seem to have a higher rate of um, exhibiting subsequent clinical events in patients where aggressive stimulation was required to induce um, polymorphic VT, or to, in, to induce ventricular arrhythmias. So I, I think the field is somewhat coming to a consensus that there may be some role in, of um, EP testing if one stimulates, if one induces with a uh, single or double extra stimuli. But um, I, I don't think that it's, I think it's less frequently used than it used to be. I think that's fair to say. Gordon, do you have comments? How do you guys practice in Hopkins? So um, provocative testing means a couple of things. One, provocative testing is drug testing. And in order to make the diagnosis, if somebody's got a type 2 or type 3 ECG, you can only make the diagnosis if you give them a drug and they develop a type 1 ECG. Then you have the diagnosis. This is based on the 2013 guidelines. Um, there are, in addition to program stimulation, and in fact, in the guidelines we developed, in a nod to the Brugada brothers, we actually put in there as a 2A indication, if you're inducible with a non-aggressive stimulation protocol, you can be considered for uh -huh. implanting a defibrillator either even back then. But there are some other things that you might look for, including conduction system disease, as well as a very short ventricular effective refractory period, uh -huh. which also, at least, and even Sylvia's group says, if you have that, uh -huh. that might increase your risk as well. I. I Obviously, we don't do any of this in people who are asymptomatic. Um, yeah. If they have an ECG type 2 or type 3 ECG pattern, we even ignore that if there really are no symptoms. Um, Can I ask you a quick, quick question about that? Doesn't it help you to know if they do the type 2 or 3s? If it doesn't happen, doesn't that help you relay their fear? So that's why I do it sometimes. It does. It depends why we're being asked to look at the ECG. If, if we're being asked to look at the ECG in somebody who's asymptomatic who doesn't have a problem, we don't stir up, as you say, we don't make the person crazy by stirring up problems. But if there's really a question about whether or not this person has Brugada syndrome, then yes, indeed, we'll do a provocative test to see whether or not they develop a type 1 ECG. Uh, so I just want to end, I think we're close to ending, so I want to end with this observation, because I think it's very interesting in, in the field. Um, this is uh, from work from Wee Natamani, who published this paper about five years ago, and what he showed was that patients with Brigada syndrome, if you do epicardial mapping, so map in the pericardial space, there are areas above the right ventricle which show this very funny, these fractionated uh, electrograms. And more recently, let me just skip, and more recently, uh, Joseph Brigada and his colleagues showed that you can actually ablate, well, both Weed Nottamani and Joseph Brigada showed that you can ablate these, um, these areas and have a favorable effect. So what you're looking at here is this is a patient uh, looking at the epicardial surface over the right ventricle, 
Purple represents normal. These other colors represent slightly abnormal. What you see in, when you give flecainide to provoke ST elevation, as you can see on this EKG, you also provoke these abnormal electrograms in this location. And importantly, you can ablate these. So this is pre-ablation. This is the baseline. And giving flecainide, you can see ST elevation. In follow-up, if you then ablate these uh, areas in the epicardial surface, that you make the brigada pattern disappear and not provocable, provocable by um, uh, pharmacologic um, uh, stimulation like flecainide or agimaline. So this is a very interesting phenomenon. So I, I want to end with you, actually, uh, Gordon. Um, one, what is it about the RV epicardium that, that allows this localization of these abnormal electrograms? And number two, is it really true that one can cure Brigada in some patients? Is this a potential therapy? Uh, as you know, some people are talking about doing this instead of defibrillators in certain um, right. cohorts. Um, I've actually sent a patient who has a defibrillator for this procedure, one, um, who had uh, multiple firings and still had multiple firings despite that, and, and actually treating them with an anti-cancer drug called dalfampridine, which is 4-aminopyridine, which is specifically inhibits ITO. Neither of those things have worked. But, but uh. that being said, I, I think <laughs> I don't have to remember that drug. This, really, <laughs> this really speaks to this really speaks to the notion of what the underlying pathogenesis here is. Presumably, these patients have these mutations from birth, but the peak incidence is in the fourth decade of life in men. Yeah. And there's some argument that it's not just a repolarization phenomenon, but instead there are conduction disturbances, which may be in fact subclinical in the absence of drug that produce the ECG pattern that produce conduction slowing in the right ventricle. And essentially what's being done here, I think, is kind of not unlike what Sonny Jackman would do to an infarct scar, try and homogenize it so that in fact there's not slow conduction, but there may be no conduction there. Mm. And that might be something that might help. I think in theory it's interesting. It does speak to the notion that this is uh, a form first of a myopathy rather than a primary electrical disease, which is something that I think people like Gaetano TNA and others argued way back in the 80s when they saw this and saw a continuum of disease that included Brugada, but also some things that may have been ARVC mm -hmm. and something of that ilk. Again, it's complex. It's complex physiologically. It's complex genetically. I think this is a this is something that I wouldn't do at this point primarily for a cure, but I certainly, and we have certainly will do it if somebody's got a defibrillator and is yep. having problems. My pleasure. So we're obviously not going to get to RV displays. I'll have to save that for another time. But I, I think I want to open it up to the floor if there are any uh, questions uh, from the audience before we, uh, before we conclude. Roger. Oh, yeah, you can't. Unless you speak into the mic, you're not allowed to talk. So one area in, uh, ventri in inherited ventricular arrhythmias has been the use of IPS cardiomyocytes, and that was really mm -hmm. nicely illustrated by Rocky Cass's uh, case, I don't know if you remember it, where it was a very complex combined long QT2 and 3, and the 3 was not identified in a panel, so they had to really fish for it. Uh, and in that case where they were throwing at this newborn a large amount of maxillotine up to seizure levels, uh, they were able to identify a pattern of uh, firing of the ICDs uh, based on the IPS work with a combination of a uh, very small amount of maxillotine without the beta blocker uh, and without the flecainide. So I was wondering where that comes in uh, in the future. Yeah, go ahead, Gordon. So we're, we're routinely collecting uh, blood and for progenitor cells in many of our patients in the Center for Inherited Heart Disease, not just arrhythmias, but others as well. I think there is a, there may well be a future. The other thing that I forget who I was talking to about this is that once we get to a point where um, we can robustly do genome editing in an intact organ, um, the, virtue of, the virtue of the electrical diseases is you don't have to fix every cell. If you fix... A, a, a number of these cells, they're electrically connected, you might be able to overcome the adverse effects of, uh, of, of the electrical abnormality in the cell. So I think there are two things where, uh, where iPS cells are going to be useful. One is as a testing platform, but the other is as a, as a platform to really kind of perfect, if you will, or make better regional, um, regional genome editing to try and fix, the, fix these kinds of problems.
Any other questions? Oh, question in the back. So uh, this is a question in terms of uh, testing family members uh, in the case of inherited arrhythmias, and I know this is a broad range. So in terms of implication uh, for buying life insurance and uh, health insurance, uh, which is going to be a bigger problem now, so uh, what are the suggestions and what are the questions, meaning how do you handle them? That's a great question. Amy, why don't you uh, take that one? Sure. So we re routinely, again, um, in collaboration with our genetic counseling colleagues, routinely counsel patients prior to doing the testing. There are certain provisions and laws that protect individuals from discrimination. There's something called the GINA Act, which um, protects against uh, discrimination for folks who work um, in an, by, uh, have an employer who employs, I think, more than 15 employees. Is that right, Megan? Um, and in that case, you can't be discriminated against um, on the basis of a, a pre-existing or known genetic diagnosis. The one caveat is in terms of life insurance, and there, that's really an exemption. So depending on the patient, whether or not they have life insurance, we always disclose this at the get-go, but they may choose to defer testing initially apply for life insurance and then do the testing later on, because usually the genetic testing is not going to make or break a, a clinical diagnostic decision um, imminently. And so that, that's one thing to be aware of, but, but that's part of the counseling package. Wait, wait uh, I mean, just so I understand. So let's say, um, let's say I have uh, the condition. I do a genetic test. I understand what, what the issues for me. But if my offspring is tested, what are the implications for him or her? They, they may not be able to get life insurance coverage for themselves. You're, I mean, if you already have life insurance in that yeah, case, yeah. then that's a separate issue. Okay. Again, you may have to defer not just genetic testing, but all testing that might reveal the presence of the disease. So if you have an electrocardiogram that's got a cute, that you have long QT, your, ch your children have QT interval prolongation on their electrocardiogram but haven't mm -hmm. been genetically tested well, um, they may still be excluded. Got it. Any other questions? No? Okay, and with that, we're going to go ahead and close, and uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks to the panel.